Good afternoon and welcome to the latest of our webinar series. Um, this is on the Article 40 of the Digital Services Act on access to data. For your information, the webinar is recorded and the recording will be available on our YouTube channel shortly. Um, in order to pose questions or take part in polls, we use Slido. Um, if you want to access Slido, you should see a QR code on your screen. Or if not, you can go to slido.com and enter the uh, code disinfo. So when you connect to Slido first, you'll get two short polls, one asking where you're joining from, and secondly, what sector you represent. You can ask questions at any time in Slido. And after Sylvia is finished with her presentation, uh, we'll come back and uh, go through the questions uh, with her. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, EU Disinfo Lab is a not-for-profit organization gathering information and expertise on disinformation in Europe. We organize these webinars to give a voice to experts of our community to help sharing knowledge and raise awareness about the work that's being done by the community. Uh, as I mentioned, the topic today is Article 40 of the Digital Services Act um, and access to, to the data of very large online platforms and search engines. This is a remarkably important aspect of the DSA. To quote um, the Director General of DG Connect um, of the European Commission, access to data to, to researchers is fundamental to have transparency in the online world. So to discuss how we're going to um, ensure this fundamental uh, aspect of transparency. We have uh, Silvia Mauricio from DG Connect of the European Commission. Silvia is a policy officer in the unit in charge of the enforcement of the Digital Services Act. She coordinates the work of, on data access for researchers, including drafting of the dedicated delegated, de sorry, delegated act. Sylvia joined the European Commission in 2014, and since then she has been working on various digital issues, focusing on the impact of technologies um, on EU societies. So um, when I pass the floor to Sylvia, uh, you can post your questions at any time um, in the um, in um, Slido. Uh, so I'll hand the floor over to Sylvia now. Um, thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Joe, and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, webinar. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to speak about Article 40. I see uh, attendees, the number of attendees is increasing, uh, so I, I think it's a, it's a good moment to start. Uh, uh, let me share. I have a few slides. It won't take much time, so we can dive in into, uh, immediately into the uh, questions. Um, I'm trying to share, so please, I, I won't see you anymore, so please just give me, say something if something doesn't work, I will try to have it full screen and minimize all the windows so you don't see any weird boxes. Okay. Should be okay. So just a... Uh, let me start with a quick uh, reminder on uh, on the what are the types of access that are provided for in Article 40 of the DSA. Joe has already uh, quoted the Director General. This is a very important piece of the uh, obligations that we impose on very large online platforms and search engines to increase their transparency and accountability. And uh, access to data is provided for different actors in Article 40. The first access is for the regulators, basically uh, the European Commission and the DSC of establishment where the VLOPs and BLOSES are located. And this is reserved for uh, monitoring assessment and compliance with the DSA. This is a, a, a bit more uh, restrictive than the empowerment that we have under the 72, which is uh, more for broader enforcement uh, uh, purposes. Then we have the vetted researchers that uh, is the most innovative type of access if you want, is the one that will give access to non-public data by uh, platforms uh, providers. And this is for its the sensitivity that this data might 
bring along is also the one reserved to uh, uh, researchers that fulfill a very strict uh, set, uh, uh, set of criteria. And this is also the one we are going to further uh, lay down the specifications in the delegated act. Then we have the access uh, provided for in Article 4012, and uh, this as an open or a more open audience, I would say, a wider audience can benefit from this, including CSOs and journalists. And it provided access to data that are public on the interface of the platform. This means uh, also scraping, but also through the uh, APIs. So this is just a quick reminder on uh, on what we are we will be addressing now. Now let me go to uh, the most innovative type of access, the delegated act, uh, uh, the one that would be regulated by the delegated act. So the reason why we're taking so long for this delegated act is that we really want this process to be as inclusive as possible. I think we have used almost all the tools that are at our disposal to consult broadly uh, in, uh, in, uh, for this delegated act. We started last year with a call for evidence. Uh, we had 133 inputs. Uh, thank you to all of you that uh, uh, contributed to this process. The inputs were very, very to the point and very useful for uh, the start of our process. You can see here a bit the distribution of who replied and what were the main findings. We also published a, an analysis of this reply that you can find in uh, at this link. The, the slides uh, will be shared. Uh, the, um, we, we have seen that respondents were calling for a very broad scope of this uh, data access needs, a need for a common application format, it was very important uh, as we are trying to do to involve researchers in the drafting because they will be the main beneficiary of this provision. And of course, to counterbalance the, um, the, this new type of access that uh, give access to non-public data, the, as a, a focus was made on the appropriate security and other protection safeguards. Uh, of course, also, uh, the, the, even though the call for evidence was more for the delegated act, the, the the importance of the 4012 access, so the access to publicly available data, was also stressed. Again, these are the other consultation we are uh, doing right now. So we started the, with the call for evidence, as we have seen. Then we went to uh, the expert pools. Well, we had a pool of experts that work with us together with uh, the European Center for Algorithmic Transparency as well to understand what are the main legal uh, implications of Article 40. There are a number, uh, it, the whole exercise, it's a balancing uh, exercise between the rights and interests of all uh, the parties involved. So it was very uh, important for us to uh, lay the ground on what are the, um, the important points that we need to address and specify more in the delegated act. Then we also had technical dis uh, discussion with the stakeholders uh, we, uh, of course, took into account the experience that EDMO has, but also the work that is done by the uh, group of uh, digital service coordinators that are working on this. We also reached out to the U.S. colleagues, and uh, just last week we had a workshop with the White House and uh, a number of experts in the framework of the cooperation with the U.S., which is the Trade and Technology Council. So now we are getting to the point where we we will see later, we, we are now finalizing a first draft and we are very eager to consult even more publicly on this. So we are trying to understand how we can test this mechanism. How can we test these first ideas that we have put on, on the draft delegated act? But this is yet uh, to come. So the difficulty in, uh, in uh, laying down the provisions for the delegated act lays in the fact that we have a number of actors involved, we have a totally new process that is being uh, set out in Article 40. And this is the journey, as we call it, for the uh, data access application. It starts, of course, with the researcher application, then the assessment that can be start with the, an initial assessment by the digital service coordinator, where the uh, research organization to which the researcher that seeks the data is affiliated, and then it goes for final assessment to this DSE of establishment where the platform, which is supposed to provide the data, is located. Then uh, we um, then uh, the, the DSE uh, formulates the reason request and submits this reason request 
specifying also the modalities for the access. Uh, uh, the, the regulation speaks about the appropriate interfaces. So how the data has to be shared in order to be able to respect all the criteria that are set out in Article 48. Developed and process, of course, have the possibility to ask for amendment. This, uh, this amendment can be based on two factors. Either they don't have the data or they uh, consider that the data will lead to significant vulnerabilities of their service. This is also a new concept that has been introduced by the DSA. So we don't refer to trade secret here, but we refer to the fact that disclosing the data could cause harm to the, to the platform. This is again, as you see, the, the balancing exercise I was mentioning before, where the public interest in the research and where the confidentiality of the data, they can collide at one point and the, and the DSC will have the, the task to understand which of, of them prevails. Then of course, once, uh, uh, if any, uh, request of the amendment is evaluated, uh, develop should provide access to the data with the access modality specified in the reason request. And uh, Article 44 has an obligation of uh, uh, publishing the results. Also here, we are thinking about how to make it even more uh, visible, all these results of the research, uh, the research for, uh, for the community, for the broader community, but also for the enforcers, because these will be important pieces of information also for regulators and, uh, um, and the general public. So what are the building blocks? We uh, are now working on the Delegated Act, basically trying to understand what are the tasks of each of the actors involved, so what the researcher should do. Uh, you know, in order to allow to have a streamlined process, uh, we would like to standardize the application process. This will help, we think, researchers to know what, they what information they need to provide, what kind of supporting documents, and what kind of level of detail it's necessary in order to uh, have their application assessed. To facilitate, of course, the standardization, we're thinking about uh, setting up an, an informatic system for managing requests. This would be linked to a, an already existing system, which is the one with, with which uh, digital service coordinators and uh, the commission uh, cooperate already on uh, on other articles of the of the DSA. This would help on the one side the researcher to have some sort of a one stop shop uh, standardized format where they can send the application and the DSCs in their or uh, in their management of the data access request considering also the cooperation that is uh, prescribed in Article 40 with the initial assessment, for example, and the final assessment. We would like eventually also to connect the, the blobs and clauses, so also the, uh, the exchanges on the amendment requests will be tracked by the system, but this, uh, as you know, uh, this uh, kind of uh, development, they take time to, be, uh, to materialize. Then we go to the digital service coordinator that will have a uh, pivotal role to play here. We are trying to give more guidance on how to assess the conditions in Article 48, uh, the formulation of the reason request. So what elements from the um, data access application should feed into, into the reason request and what uh, of this element needs to be communicated to the platforms. Um, this, of course, has a big uh, emphasis on the access modalities. And of course, we are trying to give indication on the assessment of possible amendment requests. This was also the, the subject of, uh, of the expert input to be asked. Uh, I said that these uh, significant vulnerabilities, which is the basis, one of the basis for this amendment, is a new concept. Too. So we had uh, two legal experts, uh, one from University of Amsterdam, Paddy Larsen and Matthias Vermeulen, who, had, who helped us in particular on this aspect. Then, the final step is with the very large online platforms and search engines. So here again, we are trying to give indication on when to ask this assessment and on what basis and the access modalities. The access modality. So how this data needs to be shared. Let me pause one second here. Of course, we would have liked to be uh, already uh, out with a public consultation. The reason we are not is that. The, the Delegated Act is now pending uh, legal analysis by our internal service in the, in the Commission. And this is what, uh, what I can tell you at the moment, but of course, these things can still change uh, as we still have to consult internally other DGs and we still have 
to have the final legal opinion by our uh, legal service. I have also a short update on the enforcement of Article 40, because Article 4012 is already in force for the 19 first designated platforms. You might have seen that we have uh, um, uh, sent horizontal requests for information to 17 very large online platforms at the beginning of the year. This was really to understand how, what measures they are putting in place in order to comply with Article 4012 and also to show the importance that the Commission attaches to this provision. The monitoring of compliance is ongoing. Of course, we are analyzing the replies, and for some of them, we have already taken action, uh, both on the basis of the replies, but uh, parallel uh, monitoring process uh, as well. We have opened the formal proceedings for X, TikTok, and uh, other experts, and the three of them uh, include a grievance on uh, DSA access uh, to data, uh, to publicly available data. The investigations are ongoing for all the three uh, cases. AliExpress is the last one uh, we we opened. And uh, of course, we will continue monitoring also all the other uh, platforms. With this one, I would conclude my presentation and uh, I look forward to the question. Thank you, Silvia, for a very thorough introduction to Article 40. Um, I'll just dive straight into uh, the questions that have uh, appeared so far in the Slido. Um, just to remind participants, uh, please put your questions in slido.com uh, using the code Desinfo rather than in the Q&A in Zoom. So the first question uh, is about fees for access to data under Article uh, 4012. Uh, the Commission uh, took the view that X's implementation of Article 4012 was non compliant because of excessive fees. Has the Commission come to a settled opinion on the, the imposition of fees for access to data? Yes, so the, the DSA is silent on the aspect of, uh, of the fees. So, what we can do for, for the Delegated Act is to follow the empowerment, and the empower tells us that we can set out the technical condition. So uh, as you have seen, we have a, a, a line uh, in the in the X grievance that says that it shouldn't be uh, excessive, the fee, so it shouldn't hamper the final outcome of the of the provision. So this line will also be applied for the for the vetted access. Uh, if the fees are so excessive that researchers cannot apply anymore, we, uh, we believe that the, the, the provision cannot be fully implemented, and which means for us, it is a signal of uh, non-compliance. We will apply the same line to uh, 44. So if if I can, if I understand the second half of what you just said, um, if it were, if the fee was of a level that would disincentivize the uh, vetted researcher from making the request, it's too high? Yes. Okay, that's... This is uh this is the line we have taken uh, in uh, um, in the act case, but of course for the delegated act as I said everything is pending a legal revision. Okay, uh, understood. Um, if a researcher or organization makes the uh, a um, an application, this this comes to the the point of specifics uh, in Article Forty. If you make if a uh, vetted status is granted. Is it granted for the specific application, or is it understood to be valid uh, for future applications? Article forty-eight sets out the condition for the vetting, which uh, uh, includes at criteria E and F. Really, the focus of uh, of the research. So we the, we are following the the DSA, and each vetted status will be given for a specific research project and for a specific data set that is uh, requested. Of course, we're trying to make it uh, easier to refill uh, the, the application process because we understand there might be a uh, burden for uh, for researchers, but uh, the regulation is is very precise on the criteria for the vetting. Okay, well, um, how, how precise it is might be subject to um, <laughs> some discussion. Um, 
I, there are lots of questions popping into the into Slido now, so I'm uh, trying to keep track of them all. Um, to what extent is access to APIs formalized in the in the Delegated Act, or um, to put it, and it, particularly in light of recent um, changes to APIs? APIs uh, that give access to data, to publicly available data, are uh, regulated by Article 4012, so they will not be uh, uh, dealt with in uh, in the Delegated Act. The Delegated Act is only for the vetted access, so non-public data. Okay. Um, it's a question that I've heard come up quite, quite often. Will non-EU-based organizations be able to use... Um, the mechanism provided for in Article 40. This is one of the points uh, the legal service is actually looking at. Could you give an insight into the balance that they're trying to achieve or where they see the problem? Or are they just checking to make sure there isn't a problem? The, no, the, the, what they need to check is that how we can make sure that the, so the access as uh, determined in the DSA need to be only for those researchers that fulfill at the same time all the conditions prescribed in Article 48, which means that they have to study EU systemic risks and they have to um, be able to comply with all the obligations that are that are there. So this is what the delegate the, uh, the the ESA tells us, and this is what we are elaborating in the in the delegated act with a bit more guidance for uh, the DSE on how to assess these conditions. Okay, is it um, EU, EU systemic risks or systemic risks that are also felt in the EU? EU, EU systemic risks, yeah, yes, uh, societal risk are uh, like uh, spreading of disinformation in the EU countries. Okay. Um, You said this was somewhat out of scope, but um, does the commission has the commission uh, a a view on the shutting down of CrowdTangle in this context? We are, of course, uh, uh, understanding what what are the implications of shutting down CrowdTangle for compliance with uh, Article Forty Twelve. Meta is also put at the disposal of researcher other tools. And in case you have uh, inputs on uh, this comparison uh, about the meta content library and Crowdtown, your experience with the two and uh, uh, and how, which one works uh, better, we're of course interested in uh, hearing them. Okay. Um, um, a question that came up also in a previous um, webinar, the not-for-profit angle, um, does the entity, is it the entity or the purpose that has to be not for profit? Could a, could a for profit entity um, uh, access data for research purposes for, for a non, for a not for profit research purpose? So the, um, this is for 44 or 4012. The conditions are very different. So the, the criteria, uh, all the criteria needs to be fulfilled for 44, which means including the affiliation of a research organization, and the research organization is defined within the meaning of Article 2 of the Copyright Directive. And if uh, it is for a 4012, 4012 doesn't require an affiliation of research organization, but the, here the vetting will be done directly by the VLOPs. So 4012 is meant to allow also civil society organization and journalists in particular to access to this data. Commercial purposes are of course not in the scope of uh, access to data under that. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the plan, or is there a plan for guidelines on a data access requests in Article 4012 for publicly accessible data? So this is something we have been looking at for a while. At the beginning, I think, with the uh, grievances in the case, it will be becoming clearer and clearer what is our line to take on, on 4012. But in case 
you, you feel the need for more guidance, please uh, communicate it to us and, uh, and we can uh, think about it. I'm sure you'll get lots of uh, feedback on the uh, consultation on that. Um, another uh, participant asks, what system uh, you will use to ensure data protection and security for vetted researcher um, access? Are you looking at uh, pet-based solutions, so privacy-enhancing technology solutions, or, or similar? Yes, this is a very relevant question, and this is uh, what uh, related to what I was mentioning uh, before about this balancing process. Uh, the delegated act won't set out universal rules. We understand that the um, request can be very difficult, different according to the systemic risk that is investigated and to the type of data that are asked. Uh, what we uh, are looking at now is basically uh, to uh, an approach that takes into account the risks identified related to the data and necessary safeguards. And this should be proposed at first by the researchers. So the researchers who should carry out some sort of a risk analysis of the sensitivities related to the data in terms of data protection, confidentiality, and security, and also propose some safeguards. This will be assessed by the digital service coordinator who will have the task to determine whether these are appropriate risks as identified, and if the proposed safeguards are appropriate to address these risks. This, and in the delegated act, we would like to give some examples of what are the sensitivities and the concerns that could be behind the data, in particular for uh, data protection, confidentiality, and security, and what are the type of safeguards that could be foreseen. So going from uh, anonymization to uh, secure environment processing, for, for example. Of course, always depending to uh, what is the purpose of the research and what are its the sensitivity related to the data. That um, inadvertently tees up the next question uh, quite well. Um, the question is asked whether uh, you're working on timelines for, for VLOPs to review applications. Um, because uh, a lack of a timeline could be problematic in a situation where uh, access is more urgent in a fast moving situation. The data access application will actually be reviewed by the digital service coordinators and the digital service coordinators will transmit it to the VLOPs with the recent request. And there, there is a, a timeline. Uh, the regulation in Article 40 sets out 15 working days. And a further 15. Indeed. Yes. And a further 15 if there's a. Yes, um, a request for amendment. Um, on the request for amendment, um, are you looking at a, um, a guideline for the, the, the balance that the uh, DSC is supposed to reach? Um, um, is the default position that it should be available unless um, there are compelling arguments against uh, sharing or? vice versa there this is um uh, also another very important point um the conditions under which uh, a request for amendment can be asked are set out in article 45 and here we will try to elaborate a bit more on this uh grounds for uh, for uh, for request for amendment in the delegated act great i think you partially answered this question already uh, but uh, maybe you can elaborate. Um, will the guidelines include um, help, legal help for researchers to uh, appropriately frame their DSA uh, access requests? Um, because they might not might not necessarily be in a position to uh, to frame their their request in a way that is. Um, compelling from a legal perspective under Article 40, even though compelling from a, a societal perspective. This is, this is a good point, and, uh, and we believe that uh, this is something that over time, maybe uh, we can build a sort of a best practice system where we are seeing, for example, that for, for uh, 4012, there are already initiatives coming up uh, to help researchers to understand what are the best practices and how to best 
access uh, to data. The Weizenbaum Institute, for example, they have just published uh, a, a document reviewing all the uh, reviewing some uh, of the feedback that they have uh, received for uh, access to data for the 4012. We would like to have a similar uh, exercise ongoing in this repository that we would like to create this interface that we would like to create for Article 44, where successful uh, researchers that have submitted good requests that have been vetted uh, uh, and then data shared by the platforms could also help other, uh, other researchers. Um, we can also think about a company measure if we see that this is a blocking factor for many researchers, this is something that we don't do in the delegated act, of course. Uh, but if we see that the provision has difficulties in uh, in being implemented because of this factor, this is always something that we can think about, some sort of a help desk for researchers to understand how to uh, how to submit successful requests. Thank you. And um, for participants, um, the report that Sylvia just mentioned will be linked in the uh, in the um, in our newsletter next Tuesday. So if you've not signed up for the newsletter, that's yet another reason to do so. Um, another um, broad question. Um, as we don't know everything that that um, the VLOPs collect and share, it makes it it would only be possible to gain access to certain data if the request was broad enough to cover any data that might be stored, um, but that would imply a lack of precision in the question. Um, so is it the position in the guidelines or is it the commission's perspective that broad access requests should be uh, honored by the VLOPs? So this is something that uh, came up a lot in the code for evidence and uh, in all the discussions we have with researchers. Um, the the way it is formulated uh, in uh, in uh, in Article Forty, uh, the, that access request needs to be pretty solid and already well defined. So we're trying to understand how we can help researcher to knows to know what is behind the platform, what they are collecting, and what kind of uh, possibilities they have to to access. But this is also ongoing. We're trying to see. How we can uh, how we can put at the disposal, for example, um, examples of data set and uh, predetermined safeguards that researchers could try and use at least for the first uh, uh, data access <laughs> in order to to build these repositories that the, the that I was thinking uh, I was uh, mentioning before to show that this is possible and how some uh, data access application are can be successful provided that some elements are, are in it. And this should also help to understand what kind of data are there. Thank you. Um, the question of, of commercial entities uh, comes up again um, with the hook that in the election guidelines, the commission took a very broad um, and ambitious view as regards um, who could access data. So um, in that, bear, bearing in mind that context, um, do you see commercial entities benefiting from Article 40 or interpretations of Article 40 being imaginative and uh, uh, ambitious like the election guidelines? This is really not in the intention, neither of the election guidelines or the delegated acts. So really, the purposes of the uh, data access requests are very well specified in uh, in the article, and they need to concern systemic risks as defined in uh, in Article Thirty Four of of the regulation. So, meaning that they have need to have a public interest. This is also the legal basis that a uh, researcher can use to process specific type of data uh, under the GDPR, the, the public interest uh, uh, mission. So uh, I I really hope that DSCs will be very care careful in examining the uh, data access application to rule out uh, uh, the commercial uh, interest uh, uh, request. This is also one of the criteria uh, 48, 48B uh, provides uh, for um, the researchers to be independent from commercial interest. 
Um, ah, yes. uh, for, uh, maybe more in relation to the guidelines. Uh, so uh, on on the guidelines, the idea was to bridge a bit, uh, considering that the Delegated Act will not be in force during the election, the idea was really to bridge and to allow uh, platforms to go beyond what is already prescribed and on a voluntary basis, of course, uh, allow selected entities to uh, to help them also identify the risks concerning to civic discourse and electoral processes. Uh, also here, uh, there is no intention to, to provide the competitive advantage to other commercial entities, but um, the, the, the reason why the guidelines are much more ambitious uh, than, uh, than, uh, than the Act is because these are voluntary commitments that the platform can take with the entities that they feel they respect all the criteria of independence from commercial entities, but also of, uh, uh, I guess, of uh, ethical nature and, uh, and uh, scientific purposes. Uh, what in the guidelines we never prescribe would we already mandate by law, this is the reason why uh, we we try to be even more uh, uh, um, encouraging for the platforms to take necessary steps to to really open up their their website for the third party scrutiny that we would like to see for uh, for the election. Okay, so people hoping that 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 the guidelines were a clue as to a, a new expansive understanding of Article Forty are are being slightly too optimistic. Um, going, going back to a point that was partly addressed earlier, um, one participant is asking whether it would be possible to have uh, access to assess a specific, a specific risk over a period of time rather than a specific um, access to specific data um, to analyze the evolution of an issue, I think, is what is what the question means. Um, I think the, the the article doesn't prevent doesn't limit requests on the basis of the time or on the basis of a specific risk. So what we uh, what needs to be very well specified is how the the research project for which the data are necessary and to which the data are asked to the platforms how is linked to one of them and how it will help understanding the impact of the platform choice on 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 these uh, specific risks. So, uh, on on the time frame or the type of data points, I don't see uh, limitations. Okay, and um, um, a um, long since uh, deceased uh, singer is asking about uh, whether we could have a little less action. A little less conversation, a little more action on the proceedings against uh, X TikTok and AliExpress. Um, I guess within the context of of the um, the proceedings that you men mentioned on on X, um, how you see time wise and um, success wise this moving forward. So investigations are ongoing, and uh, of course the team is working on uh, all the grievances, collecting all the evidences that are uh, necessary. And on this one, I cannot really say more. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so going back to can you provide a bit of um insight into um uh, the the decision making process in in the case of a um a request for amendment by the by the DSC and whether whether the DSCs will be sufficiently coordinated among themselves that the um the reaction will be predictable and consistent across um uh, across the different DSCs. It's it's quite um, unclear in the in the DS, DSA um, what would happen in those cases. So the, the good news is that we now have a, a board of digital service coordinators, which is meeting every month. 
uh, we are uh, we will soon have our third meeting and we're working very closely with uh, uh, we have been working also in the past months with a group of uh, proto DSCs which is led by um, the German DSC uh, that um, is really uh, working very closely with us on the delegated act they also uh, uh, came up with the proposal to have uh, a sort of a memorandum of understanding among themselves to regulate all the aspects that are not regulated by uh, the delegated act or fall outside of the empowerment that we have for for this provision. So uh, the 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 work is ongoing there, and the board will always provide a, a forum of discussion also for these uh, questions which are more technical and concern uh, in, in particularly data access. We also hope that uh, the informatics system would really provide a useful tool for this kind of communication by providing a common database, by providing common uh, access to the to the application files, but also allowing uh, you know exchanges and you know uh, to for the researcher maybe to even to create a profile to keep in the in the in the database so they can be simulated to to resubmit uh, um, that access request. We believe that these are the at least the two building blocks, cooperation under the board and IT system, on which we would really like to continue uh, working uh, uh, on Article 40 with the DSCs. Um, if it were the case, so we've got 15 minutes left. So um, if, you, if there are other questions, uh, feel free to put them into Slido. Um, if the uh, platform isn't happy with the response to its request for um, for amendment to the to the request has it no more avenues to to go through or um, is there something else it could do and could it could they and not that they would and i'm not suggesting that they would but uh, maliciously uh, delay the process uh, by uh, referring it um, to a court, how, what would the next step be? We are also exploring into some solutions for this because we we really want to avoid the scenario that you just depicted. That you know they just uh, submit the request for amendment and this is not uh, uh, accepted by the DSC and the the, the process stalled. Uh, we are really looking into possible solution from mediation to arbitration to. Uh, link it to maybe some out of court dispute settlement mechanisms, and but this is also under uh, uh, bigger revision. So uh, this is something we have very well in mind. Okay, so that sounds like a, quite a major issue that uh, needs to be addressed. Um, one of the participants wants to loop back to what we were discussed earlier about a nominal fee. Yes. Our, is it it's the is it the commission's settled view that uh, they are entitled to uh, to ask for a nominal fee and at most it has to be nominal? Unfortunately, um, during the negotiation, someone forgot to say for free next to the data access provision, so we cannot say otherwise. We cannot actually impose it uh, now. Uh, because it, the legal text doesn't give us this uh, this power, so uh, this is the line we uh, we uh, came up with uh, with our legal service. Although you, one could argue that anything anything that's not nominal is contrary to the object and purpose of the provision and therefore not valid, and anything that is nominal is a waste of everybody's time, <laughs> um, and therefore logically. But you, you you feel that you've got no option other than to accept the 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 notion that a nominal fee would be legal. As you as you've seen, we also made this point in the decision, and this is where we hope that we will have the court been settling this uh, this issue at one point. This will help us a lot. So in two thousand and twenty six. No, I'm here. Okay. Um, uh, there's a question on the rules for sharing uh, data by researchers yes. with third with 
with other researchers, but I guess with other entities. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on what's envisaged or uh, on that basis? Uh, the blue one, uh, no, uh, the, not the second one. Uh, if a researcher can share the data once they have been uh, provided. Yeah. So uh, um, the vetting conditions have to be fulfilled by everyone who sees the data. So uh, we know that uh, this is difficult for peer review uh, purposes, but uh, considering the sensitivities that might be attached to these data, the sharing can only happen among vetted researchers for that specific process. Do you envisage a possibility of pre-vetting? So you said that some data can be, um, would be sensitive, but some data might not be sensitive. So would you envisage a way of, of pre-clearing certain data um, for um being usable in a in a peer review setting so this is uh these are part of the options that we are exploring for not for the delegated act not to be set out in uh, uh in uh, in a legal text but really to encourage researchers to have access to some data which are maybe less sensitive in an easier manner so this is something we're working on also we have I started uh, thinking about it with the um, with the pool of experts, but uh, now as soon as we will have the delegated act uh, public, we also have to engage in a we hope constructive dialogue with the VLOPs and BLOSES to understand what they can make possible uh, under these conditions. Okay. Um, another question from from the participant is asking how much methodological control or maybe insight do VLOPs have to have on research proposals? Um, are access requests approved on the basis of detailed methodologies or just an abstract? The, the access requests, so the, um, the Article 48 also asked for information on the planned research activities. And so the methodologies will also be part of the uh, data access application in order to be able to, uh, for the DSC to assess uh, the application. Of course, the DSC analysis is not on the merit of the request. It's not on the scientific excellence of the of the project that is uh, being that will be performed uh, by having access to the data. This we believe it's something that. Uh, the scientific community should be in charge of uh, maybe the university that does the review process of the uh, research projects. I guess also in the universities, uh, there are ethical committees looking at this, uh, uh, how plan uh, the research activities are conducted. And also, this is also, these are also the entities that could help researchers in figuring out the legal safeguards that could be attached uh, to the data. All these, I would say, or for, for information to the DSC should also be transparent uh, in the data access application. But this is for the vetting. And the reason the request, which is the output of the vetting and what will be sent to the video, doesn't need necessary to include all this. I mean, once the, the, the researcher is vetted, the VLOP should have the certainty that the, uh, the DSC has done the due diligence and the researcher can be trusted provided that specific access modalities and uh, appropriate interface have been defined to protect the data. Could I um, reimagine that answer as suggesting that the DSC would be an under, under a, a not, not an, an obligation, but a, um, a need to share as little as possible of so the the researcher asks for xyz in order to achieve abc the dsc says this is um uh, worthy this 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 fits all the requirements and the request can be made but the request to the vlop should be please provide xyz to the researcher and not please provide XYZ in order to achieve ABC. 
So the, the formulation of the reason request is actually uh, uh, spelled out in Article 40, and indeed doesn't require the whole content of the data access application to be to be transmitted. So uh, it, it's uh, the, the the article already spells out what are the parts that need to be communicated to the uh, to the VLOPs, and it doesn't include all the information that a researcher may uh, decide to submit to the DSC. Indeed. So they should err on the side of caution and communicate in principle as little as possible because otherwise the the VLOP might be given accidentally given reasons to um, delay and uh, slow down the process. Not that they would, of course. I think the dynamics here would be very interesting to to observe. That's why we we would like to engage in a constructive dialogue also with the VLOPs ahead of the provision in order to actually make it fly as soon as uh, we have the delegated act because these uh, these dynamics it, are very difficult to predict and not all VLOPs will act the same. Uh, so we are trying to set out the rules in a as clear as possible uh, manner so as to ensure the legal certainty certainty for all the actors involved. Then of course there will be there will be things that we will learn with uh, with time, and uh, we hope that uh, by giving access to uh, as many researchers as possible, then we will build some sort of a common knowledge on how to formulate the request, what are the data that the platforms uh, have and they collect that they can be shared and how can be shared. But uh, at least at the beginning, I think we really need this uh, this dialogue with the with the platforms, considering that this is an obligation that they have to comply with. How they can also help uh, help uh, the rolling out. Okay, that's um, uh, an interesting aspect that I hadn't thought about before. Um, another question is asked on whether the commission is still. Uh, looking at the option of an intermediary body to hold requested data as proposed by the EDMO working group? So um, we are exploring different options. The the work done uh, by EDMO uh, has been very, very useful. They all have also run a pilot project with uh, some of the uh, proto DSCs, some researchers, and uh, they also involve data protection authority. So we're working very closely with, uh, with them to understand what are the uh, best options that we have uh, on the table. Uh, we acknowledge the fact that some of the requests, in particular, maybe for amendment requests or for um, that access request that foresees um, safeguards, uh, particular safeguards, there might be the need for consultation. And we will uh, try in the delegate act to set uh, these out as, as I said, we hope as clearly as possible. That kind of ties with the third question on the screen as regards um, APIs. Um, the person is asking, say that they don't understand the comment on APIs and how they concern publicly available uh, data. Um, how how would VLOPs provide access, uh, provide private data via curated databases? It could, it could be an API, of course, yes, but it could also by a, a curated database. It could be also uh, through secure environment processing. For example, in the Atmo pilot, what um, they agreed to was to use the um, um, CASD uh, uh, secure environment uh, processing located in France. Okay. Um, somebody makes the... Um observation that the Irish DSC um, uh, appears to believe that commercial data entities could benefit from Article 42 uh, of 4012. Uh, Are you aware of this? Um, this is uh, this is new to me, but I would uh, I would be interested in uh, understanding why uh, why this came out uh, in this way. Okay, um, I think We've gone through all of the uh, the questions that uh, have come in, um, and on that basis, I think we can uh, we can start to to wrap up. Um, so um, I would like to thank uh, you, Sylvia, for um, for uh, answering a huge number of questions 
in uh, in this hour. Um, the uh, upcoming uh, webinars and our series are available on our website. Um, the recording of this webinar will be shortly available on YouTube. Um, uh, you will also find on our uh, website information about our upcoming conference. Um, if you've got, if the commission or participants have got any uh, uh, suggestions for upcoming webinars that um, would be interesting in the disinformation uh, space, uh, you're, everyone is very welcome to make suggestions. And um, on that note, I would uh, thank everyone again and uh, wish you a happy afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.